Welcome to another OptoPlanner video. Uh, this time we won't be, talk, uh, won't be talking about uh, use case, but I'll be talking about the OptoPlanner Benchmarker. The OptoPlanner Benchmarker is a toolkit you get with OptoPlanner, and you don't put it in your production class pad. It's a, a jar which you only use during development to find out which optimization algorithm is best for your use case. So for example, uh, let's suppose we have um, a number of data sets, data sets A, B, C, and D. Uh, in this case, it's for the cloud balancing use case, uh, 100 computers, 300 processes in the data set A, twice as many computers and, and processes in data set B, and so forth. And then we benchmark this against a number of different solver configurations. So we try Tableau Search, which is a metaheuristic, simulating, which is not a metaheuristic, and so forth. And what the benchmarker will do for us is he will take every data set for every solver configuration and he will run those for the amount of time we specified. So for example, let's say five minutes or maybe just one minute, depends on, on uh, what you prefer. And then it will tell you uh, the score results of those and will tell you which is the best one to use in production. And it will tell you, give you a lot more information. That's just that's just the tip of the iceberg of the information that it will give you. So um, if you run a specific benchmark, he will give you this nice benchmarking report, which gives you all kinds of information, a couple of statistics, as you can see, a couple of tables with information. And uh, with this information, you can actually get to understand your use case better. And most importantly, you can easily decide which uh, algorithm you want to use in production uh, because it also will tell you which algorithm is the best actually. Okay, so uh, how does this work? Well, first of all, you need to configure it, of course. So what you do is you normally have the solver um, configuration, right? As you see here on the left, uh, the solver config, which has a, a solver root element. Now, instead of creating that, you create a new XML file, which is the uh, which has a planner benchmark root element. And that planner benchmark root element has multiple or one or multiple solver benchmark elements. And such a solver benchmark element is just basically just a name and a solver configuration. So you can copy paste your solver configuration inside the inside such a solver benchmark element basically. Now, because you will have multiple solver benchmarks, here's one, here's one as you can see, and you don't want to repeat the same information all over again uh, every time for each solver benchmark, like the solution class, like the, how the score director factory and so forth, you can uh, you can have an inherited solver benchmark as I've shown here, which has this uh, you know general information which applies for every single solver benchmark. So uh, in this case, I'm setting the score factory and so forth. I'm also, as you can see, very important important here setting the time li limit on five minutes so every solver benchmark has five minutes that's that's what it inherits that's the, that's what it gets furthermore we also we can we also need to specify our data sets so where it can where can it get those and this is in this problem benchmarks so as you can see here i have uh, five data sets which are over here input solution files now uh, in my case uh, they are coming from an extreme uh, xml file uh, but you can easily uh, get them from your own format or from the database by implementing the problems file, so, uh, file IO. So the problem file IO interface just has a read method uh, and a write method, but you only have to need the read method in this case and um, to be able to read the, file, the uh, data sets into uh, memory. Uh, furthermore, what I also do is I can enable and disable certain statistics. So the summary statistics are always there, but the problem specific statistics, uh, they might influence the result of the benchmark. So as a result, as a that's why they are disabled by default um, because they, they, they create some overhead, right? And, um, but you can, as you can see, there are many, many here and you can enable them all if you want to and get more information. So when you do this, um, it will write this benchmark uh, report and then more information in the output uh, in the benchmark directory, which you can specify right here. So um, you can see I'm, I'm writing it to local data and then the use case. So uh, when we go there, so first of all, this is a local file because I run many benchmarks and I don't want to sub, uh, check these in into Git or Subversion because that, that they're, they would take up too much space. Further, and um, here are all the different use cases I have. 
uh, all different examples I have. Each one has their own uh, benchmarking directory. And then if you take a look at, for example, the cloud balancing benchmark directory, for every time I run a benchmark, the benchmarking framework automatically creates a new timestamp, as you can see here, and writes its the, the information in there. So, um, and I sometimes, as you can see, I suffix it to just to remember what it exa exactly does. Now, if we then look at some one of these um, Ben benchmarks that we ran, we can actually open it and we can see there's an index HTML file in there, which is the benchmark report. So that's the one I, I, I'll be showing you, I've shown you earlier and then I'll be showing you in a minute in detail. Now, furthermore, we also get for every data set and for every algorithm that we ran, we also get uh, the, if, if it had these problem statistics, we get a CSV file, so we can actually post-process those and we get the, the, the graphs, which I'll, I'll be showing in the uh, report too. So there's lots of information in there. Okay, so uh, let's take a look at the um, uh, benchmark report. So the first thing we have, is we have the best score summary. This is one. This is by far. This is one of the most interesting uh, graphs. What it, will, what it shows you is um, for every data set. So you can see the data sets on the bottom here, all five of them. It shows every algorithm. So uh, every color here is a different algorithm, and it shows you the result of that. And higher is better. So you can easily see that if you compare these uh, algorithms, that the red one is terrible. The blue one is less terrible and then the green yellow and um, purple, pink one are uh, competitive and they're pretty much the same but of course uh, one is slightly better on average than the other right and if you actually look at that the actual here we also have the in same information but in, in a table format so this is uh, data set one Right, and uh, each line is one of the solver configurations. So data set one against, uh, let's say, Tabu search is this score, and against Simul leading, then it's this score. You can see that um, this score is actually better. It's 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 uh, you, uh, and in, in cloud, but this is for cloud balancing. So it represents the maintenance cost we have to pay for uh, our cloud, uh, our to our cloud prov provisioner. Uh, so um, the less computers we use, the less we have to pay. So um, this is, of course, more interesting. This is here we have to pay 930 less than over there. So that's interesting. But you can see that the big game, big difference is, of course, with those two other algorithms. Um, now to quickly explain the difference, these three are the meta heuristic algorithms, the things which you which optimize. Uh, uh, the, the real, the real interesting algorithms in OptoPlanner, and these two are the first fit constriction heuristics. So, uh, and first fit the decreasing one. So, what um, what you will find in in um, in uh, in most companies who don't use OptoPlanner yet, or who have human planners, is that the results will basically be similar to first fit or first fit decreasing. So, um, yeah, this is of course. Um, uh, this is playing in, these algorithms play in a different ballpark, right? So um, what the uh, what the benchmarker here tells you is that if he would have a choice, he would say, I, I recommend you to use similar needling in production because if you look at the average score, that's actually the best one. Now do notice that it's not always the best on every single data set. As you can see here, it's the best on four out of five data sets, but on this particular data set, in those five minutes, type of search is the best. Still, I will be using uh, similar leading and prediction um, because yeah we cannot predict in advance uh, which uh, because there, there's a little bit of, of the algorithms take some random listen to account and and um, uh, that's just the way meta heuristics work and uh, that's that there, there might be slight differences and it might be a little bit better or a little bit worse on a particular data set uh, what you ha do have to know is that they always start from the results of the first fit decreasing algorithm, so they will always be better than that. So you will never see that these meta heuristics are worse than the blue one. So the, the, the three last colors will always be at least as good as the blue one. And as you can see, uh, in 99.9% in .9 of the cases, uh, if not more, uh, they will be uh, seriously better, right? Now, uh, we have many other statistics, but an interesting one is to show this relatively. So uh, what we can do is we can take the worst algorithm, which is the first fit decreasing algorithm, and then compare the other algorithms uh, against that relatively, how much percent it's better. So how much percent uh, are we basically saving in maintenance fees for our cloud 
um, provisional um, right. So um, if we do that, we can see that uh, the, over here, the green one on the first data set has nine, is 90% better. The, the, the yellow one is 20% better. So uh, we can then average that out again, and we can see that uh, simulating is on average 21% uh, better than first fit. Um, so if a customer, if um, your company is currently using first fit, or maybe they're probably not using first fit, that would most companies actually go for first fit decreasing, then you can easily see that it will be 21 minus 4% is about 17% better. Um, so uh, which is a nice gain, right? If you can save 17% on your cloud uh, costs, if you're a, a big company, that can be a lot of money. So um, it's definitely worth uh, investing in these, in using these algorithms uh, and a solver such as OptoPlanner, right? Um, now, on top of so. This is uh, now on top of that, we also have performance summaries, uh, performance graphs. So what it does here is it uh, prints how fast it's solving, how many scores per second it can calculate. So what is the score? Per s so um, every time OptoPlanner changes something, it calculates the score. And if um, and if, the, if you have a good score calcul calculation, um, so if you're using the rules or the, the Java, the incremental Java one, what you will see is you will see no degradation as the problem scales out. So on the x-axis we have the problem scale, which is the number of entities times the number of values. So as the as, as the data set gets bigger, uh, we get more over here. So let me just show you that. So for the 100 and 300 processes, the problem scale is basically the, the multiplication of those, of the number of computers, number of times the number of processes so we get 30,000 here and for the bigger cases we get a much bigger number of course right so that's that's what we see on the x-axis and on the y-axis we then see how fast uh, how many scores per second we can calculate now uh, interesting thing to note here is as the problem scales out the degradation in uh, score calculation is actually not that big um, it actually, it's, as you can see, there's a, we don't lose, a little, it doesn't get a lot slower if our, our problem begins, becomes a lot bigger. And uh, that's a good thing, because if we, for, would we, for example, using uh, easy Java score calculation, which doesn't do incremental stuff, which doesn't do deltas, you would see that it actually hits, it, 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 it's terrible, it, it, it basically goes to null as the, as the problem becomes bigger. Uh, and uh, that's not a good thing, of course because that means we cannot scale. So this is very important to be able to scale. If you want to be able to scale, you have to have uh, a good, uh, this graph needs to look good. And um, if you use rule score calculation, then you will probably, then it should be looking good uh, in, in the form of this uh, thing. And if you use incremental Java score calculation, you can actually go a little bit faster or actually quite, you can go, quest scalability is about the same. Uh, but performance-wise, you can actually go faster. Uh, but there is a lot more maintenance um, that work to, to, to make that happen and to keep that up to date. So we definitely recommend to stick with rules, which is our, the best option. Now, um, what you can also see is that some of the algorithms are actually a lot faster. That's not that's because it's uh, unfair because uh, the first fit and the first fit decreasing algorithm over here, they um, are faster because they calculate the score of uh, partially uh, solutions instead of entire of entire solutions. So um, they're cheating. Um, and um, they're not really cheating, but that's just the way uh, they work. They just, uh, they, 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 they construct partial solutions. So um, it's not a fair comparison to compare them with the others. Uh, in this particular case, the Tabu search one is also better. And uh, that's an interesting thing here. That's because we enabled all of the, um, uh, problem statistics and they actually take some they have some overhead and they have a much much bigger overhead on uh, simulating and late acceptance than they have on tabu search because the the tabu search is a slow stepping algorithm and the other are fast stepping algorithms again this is the detail but um, what you will see like i can show you in another uh, benchmark i ran is that normally tabu search you can see here tabu search late acceptance that they are, do have about the same speed if you don't enable all those extra problem benchmarks now um so what are those problem benchmarks okay so we have a couple of other benchmark uh, summary benchmarks of course but they are not that interesting shows you how much time we spent like for example 
uh, we spend on all algorithms five minutes. You can see that on the construction heuristics, they cannot, um, they when they are finished, they are finished. They cannot uh, use that extra time they get uh, of those five minutes, so they finish up, finish early. But you can see that all the metrics nicely stopped at five minutes. Now, um, what we can, so what I spoke earlier about is the problem statistics. So for one particular problem data set, like, like for example, for, for this data set, we can generate uh, also statistics. Now, if we, like I've shown before, we actually have to enable those, right? So uh, you see here, I've, I've just enabled the best score for this one, but you can enable all of them. Uh, in this case, they're actually all enabled, as you can see, while in the other, and this is another benchmark of the, uh, where they, only one of them is in, enabled. Um, Important to, to note is that if you enable them, they will influence the benchmark. Uh, the best score one won't influence it much, but some, like the um, uh, memory use and so forth, they will definitely influence the benchmark and will give and will uh, basically make it slower. And that's also what you saw in the performance for the uh, uh, earlier. That and, and this affects some algorithms more than it does others, right? So it's not all, so by default they're not enabled. That's the main reason why they're not enabled by default. So okay, what does the best score one show? Is the best score one shows us every uh, how the best score evolves over time. So as we give it more time, how much does this best score improve? And this is how this graph should look like because what you see is if in the first few seconds it increases a lot, the score uh, gets a lot better, right? And then it flatlines as we get to the near optimal to the near optimal solution or to the optimal solution. Um, so uh, and at some point it flatlines up to at the optimal solution, of course. Now um, it's important. So that's interesting to note that if you would give it, let's say, 20 minutes, this is the score which you would get with double search, and this is the score you would get with similar with uh, late acceptance. With similar annealing, uh, you might actually get even a better score because that actually projects itself to the amount of time uh, it, is, it is given. But the others are uh, more, uh, what you see here is what you get. Now, um, an interesting thing there is that, um, so you could say, um, I can just run it for 20 minutes in, in production, uh, but if you have five minutes, why not run it for five minutes and you get a slightly better score, but uh, without, uh, but if, if uh, that the extra time doesn't really, if that extra time, if you have it, why not use it? Um, interesting thing, is that um, if your graph doesn't look like this, if it looks like a line just going up, is that there's plenty of room for optimization that you've not even reached started flatlining that yet. And um, as we actually go to bigger and bigger data sets, you will see that we are less flatlining already, right? So uh, this is less sharper. And um, this is an, that's an interesting observation. Then you get a clue, okay, maybe I need to spend more time in this or I need to find ways to uh, speed this stuff up. Um, and we have a couple of ways to do that. Um, and, and then we will get, uh, we will flatline earlier. While it, once you start off flatlining, you basically know that mm, it's really not worth investing more time to get this better and better because this is what, this is what we'll get, right? Okay, um, furthermore, we have many other statistics uh, uh, I won't go into them. Some actually show the particular constraint type. So if you have uh, multiple constraints type, all of the of, uh, soft constraints, for example, you can actually show how they how their score uh, uh, related to each other and how it evolves and so forth. Um, we have many more statistics. Um, on top of that, we all uh, so once the, that those were the problems statistics and the problem uh, data sets, uh, then we also have for each solver configuration that you configured, we actually out print, we print out what you, uh, how it was configured. So that allows you to easily copy paste that into your uh, prediction solver configuration. So in this case, it's telling you, you should be using similar dealing production. So you can copy paste this one and put that one into your solver configuration, right? And you can ignore the other ones. Um, and furthermore, we have some benchmark information uh, which tells you on which kind of machine it runs, which kind of Java and so forth, which version of OptoPlanner. This allows you to um, easily um, check if two benchmarks, if you ever have two benchmarks, if they were, if they are a fair comparison or not, right? Okay, so that's what the basic benchmarking uh, tool 
toolkit basically gives you. But uh, on top of that, we can do a couple of other things, right? So um, maybe you've seen it or maybe you haven't, but uh, no, you haven't. But let me show you. So this is our uh, oh, this is our data there, uh, there. So where I have the curriculum course, right? And as you can see, uh, at some point I ran the curriculum course on JDK 6 and JDK 7 and also on JDK 8, actually, although I didn't suffix it here. And um, I want to see how they compare against each other. Now, the problem is that um, in one particular benchmark, uh, you run one part against one particular JVM, against one particular code base. Um, you can configure different uh, solver configurations, but you cannot tell them to use different code bases or different um, or different JVMs or stuff like that. So what you can, but 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 how we, uh, how did we solve this quite easily? Well, you re just run both of them, and then uh, after you've run them, you take the the aggregator. Uh, the benchmark aggregator, and you can basically, uh, and what the, this allows you to do is, um, is just some some local app you can start up, and you can select two benchmarks, right? Um, here are two different benchmarks, and you can generate a report of the uh, of their of how they look against each other. So uh, I'm now taking these two benchmarks, which both of them have uh, only one solver configuration, regrettably, and then I'm, I'm generating it. And once this is done, I can show this in the browser, right? And then it will show me in the browser, as you can see, how they compare against each other. And apparently, they, in this particular case, they don't. it's quite clear which one is better and which one is not. I don't think they, they ran long in this case. Um, so that's one thing you can do, right? And then the second thing you can do is... Uh, the second thing you can do more than just use the benchmarker is use the templating support. So how does that work? Well, let's say you want to try, you want to tweak a particular value, right? So let's say you want to tweak, uh, really tweak the taboo value, right? So you don't, you're not, you're saying, okay, the, the default is good, but if I can tweak it and get 1% improvement, well, my company is actually uh, quite big. So 1%, um, spending 1% less, uh, expenses uh, for a particular planning problem uh, will be uh, will save a lot of money, and it's really worth spending that extra time to, to to tweak it a little bit further. So for the power users, you what you can do is you can tweak these these particular values, and then instead of using the default, and what you can then do is uh, with uh, with the templating benchmark, what you can do is you can um, you configure a planner benchmark as you did in an XML file, but this time we do it in a free marker XML file. And then you just configure one solver benchmark, as you can see here, but we put it in a for loop. Actually, it's in two for loops in this case. We have a for loop for uh, different entity ta taboo values and a for loop for different account uh, accepted account limit values. And so for every combination of these two lists, it's going to add an, another solver benchmark. And um, so we get a lot of solver benchmarks, right? And then for each of those solver benchmarks, benchmarks it will run them against each of the input solution files so um it will be a lot of benchmarks right so you definitely want to run this during the night um, and then if you come back in the morning then you'll get a large report with lots of information so and it might look a little bit like like this one where uh, as you can see we ran a lot of here it was only five data sets but we ran a lot of uh, different solver configurations you can see there were actually only there was this one with where we had the 10 the 20 the 30 which was um, uh, used by a free marker variable basically and um, you can then see which is the best one now luckily we have the graph uh, we have the table because in the graph uh, yeah, it becomes too ver. There's just too much information. Nothing becomes readable anymore. But in the graph, what we can then easily see is okay. Okay, this one is the best one. This is the one which I'll keep. Right. Uh, furthermore. Uh, with the uh, aggregator, we can actually throw out, filter out the non-interesting ones, so we can actually uh, get a uh, get a graph which will be readable again, in, except of, uh, instead of this this one, right? Um, but the so the templating benchmark is very powerful to do power tweaking, basically, right? Uh, just make sure you don't over uh, fit, uh, over tweak. Uh, just like you shouldn't be over tweaking your um, JVM garbage collector. Uh, just be careful not doing that. And to to avoid doing that, the best uh, the best remedy for that is just to add more problem benchmarks. They uh, data sets. They make sure that you don't over tweak. Okay. Um, so uh, that's uh, 
my video for today so i hope you enjoy watching and if you want more want more information about autoplanner uh, just go to the website autoplanner.org